welcome him on his birthday this morning. Awesome. All right. My, I got my mic in there. Can you hear me? All right, awesome. Well, hey, I'm, I'm so excited. Uh, Pastor Mike and uh, Miss Kathy just send their love. They are in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, I wanted to say that with a southern accent, but I didn't, I didn't live in Texas that long. Uh, they are visiting with uh, their daughter, uh, Krista, um, who is at a missionary internship at the Interna- International House of Prayer um, in Atlanta. So they'll be back Monday. But I have the amazing blessing to just, uh, just share a, a message with you guys this morning um, that I'm, I'm very excited about. And uh, it's also my birthday, too, so this is probably one of the coolest birthday presents I can have is to uh, hang out with you guys and to uh, speak a message I believe the Lord has put on my heart. So let's just, uh, let's just pray for the message. God, we thank you for who you are. And Lord, I just pray um, that you anoint my words, God, that anything that um, is of you, God, that you just bless it as it goes forth. And if there's anything that is, that is not of you, God, just take it out. God, I pray you just prepare our hearts for the word that you want to speak to us this morning. And I pray uh, today that in, in some way we... Um, Come closer to your spirit, your presence, and even uh, your purpose for our lives. In your name we pray, amen. Well, we've been talking about heaven and earth and talking about um, heaven on earth. And and the tagline Pastor Mike came up with was touching heaven, changing earth. And this morning I want to talk about your heavenly purpose. Man, what is the purpose for your life here on earth that has been commissioned by heaven, commissioned by God for your life. Because God has given you a God-given purpose, a calling for your life. But a lot of times, our decisions, our circumstances, our choices cause us to lose sight of that purpose. I believe you can find God's purpose for your life many ways, that God can reveal it to you in many ways, but I want to focus on three this morning. The first one I want to focus on is intimacy, then obedience, and then experience. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, we discover this young man named David. David was the youngest child. David is a shepherd and he takes care of his sheep. That is where God put him in his life. He spent time watching over the sheep that he was entrusted with and to take care of and and, and he spent time with God. But in 1 Samuel 16, Samuel, the prophet Samuel, comes to David's house and anoints him as king. Why David? I mean, he had older brothers, he had siblings. God, God sent Samuel there, but why did, David, why did David get anointed? Well, it says it here in 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, because Samuel was going through all the brothers, and the Lord said this, he says, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. A couple chapters earlier in 1 Samuel chapter 13, after Saul disobeys God, God speaks to Saul through Samuel and he says this, he says, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Then in Acts, we we focus back on this and we reflect on the change of leadership and it says this in Acts 13 Verses 22, it says, after removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. So now David, the shepherd, gets told, hey, you're going to be king. You're anointed to be king. And even after David is anointed to be king of Israel, he still went back to shepherding his father's sheep. You see, sometimes God will show you a window to your future while still calling you to remain in your present. Later in Samuel chapter 16, verse 14, the current king Saul was being, says that he was being tormented by spirits. So he asked his subjects to find uh, someone who can play an instrument. David gets requested. Think about that. That's the equivalent, right, of, of you just like being able to play an instrument in your bedroom and then like the president of the United States going, hey, I want you to come over here to the White House and I want you to be my personal musician. I mean, that's kind of crazy. I mean, David went from singing to an audience of one to singing to the king of Israel. But I wonder why God gave David that opportunity. Oh, come on. We, 
You don't think he was the only one who could play an instrument in Israel. But why? Why, why? why did God allow that to happen? You know, there's some things that we can read in the scriptures and some that we can just wonder and guess. I, I think the first reason probably would be is that God called David to minister to Saul. It says when David played, it soothed Saul. But I wonder, I wonder what conversations David might have heard. I wonder what conversations or things he might have, might have watched. I mean, he's just a shepherd boy, right? But now all of a sudden he's serving the king. I wonder if he was able to witness some of the nuances of, of, of a king and the decisions that he need to make and, and the weight that he carries. As I was praying, this, this, this thought came into my head, and I, I can't prove this, but I, I wonder what David saw. I wonder if David saw a king that was anointed by God, that disobeyed God and made his own decisions, and because of those decisions, it ruined him. I wonder if God wanted David to see that. See what it would look like for somebody who was anointed to be king of God's people. Have it all crash and burn. He probably did. <laughs> he probably saw what a lot of people didn't see. Really crazy to think about. And I, I think about the scriptures where, you know, in the, in the Psalms where David goes, search me, oh God. Search my heart, God. If there's any sin, God, is there anything I, I don't see? I, I wonder from the back of his head, he's going, God, don't let me make the same mistake Saul made, God. I want to be a king and a servant of you. But don't you think this opportunity had its challenges? I don't know if I'd be excited to, to play for King Saul. I mean, you think, oh, that's pretty cool, man. You know, pray for the president, you know. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're like, oh, excited about it. But I think there's a little bit of pressure there. Remember, it says in the scripture that, that Saul was tormented, right? And, and, and what, was, what was soothing Saul? Well, David playing the instrument, right? So I, th- I, just, I, know, I, I feel like the atmosphere would be a little bit stressful, right? Because like, it's, it's because God's, God, the Spirit of God is with David, and, and David is playing the instrument, right? So I would, I mean, Pastor Brendan, I wouldn't want to miss a note, right? I mean, I mean Pastor Brendan, you know, I, you guys know I don't do good with rhythm, right? You see me clapping, and I'm like all off and everything, and then you see Tony go, no, Donald, it's like this, you know? But, you know, but, but seriously, like, you know, he's playing an instrument, and he's like, dude, and, you know, it's like, oh, everybody in the, the room's like, oh, he missed a note, right? I mean, there could have been some pressure there, but also, David was anointed by Samuel to be king and replace Saul. Hold on. David was going to replace the man across the room from him. So if I was David, I'd be stressing out a little because I would go, man, if Saul finds out that I have been anointed to be king, that God has called me to be king, man, he might do something to me. And we fast forward in chapter 18, and Saul does. After David defeats Goliath, Saul be, says Saul begins to get jealous, and he tries to kill David. It's an interesting thought, the situation. I mean, because it was a lot more easy to probably play in the, she, in the, in the shepherd's field than play in front of Saul. I mean, when you're in the shepherd's field, you're playing, and you, when you do good, the sheep go, Bah, right? I mean, right? That's probably what they do. And when you're playing and you do bad, the sheep go, bah. I mean, there's not really like, you know, it's, it's like he's not the, not the Simon Cowell of the sheep, you know? I mean, there's not, not much stress there. One question I have for you this morning is what do you see when you look at your life situations right now? When you face challenges, when you face trials, Some people completely abandon God when tough times happen, but a lot don't. But it affects their mind. It affects their vision, though, those trials and those challenges. But the Lord gave me this picture when I was praying and meditating on this. Is that some people hold like this rope when they're going through a tough time. They hold on to it, and they go, okay, God, this is really tough right now. This season is challenging. There's so many things going on. It's very stressful. 
all right, God, I'm, I'm just going to hold on to you. And they just stay focused. They keep their eyes closed, and they, they just hold on to God. You go, what's wrong with that? No, nothing. It says in the word of God that we're supposed to put our hope in the Lord, that we're supposed to put our trust in him, that he is our rock, our shield, and our fortress, our strong tower. There's nothing wrong with that. But the question the Lord asked me when I see in this picture, because I was reflecting on my own life and the times I did that, and the question God asked me is, go, Donna, why, why are your eyes closed? Why, why are your eyes closed? You see, so many times, all we focus on is getting through that we miss the reason why we're there. We're so focused on, okay, God, I'm, if I just make it through, God, if I just hold on to you, God, if I just do this, when God goes, wait, you're, there's a purpose in the midst of what you're doing right now. There's a purpose in the midst of where I have you right now. And You might go, well, Pastor Donald, you don't know my situation. You don't know the stress I have at work. You don't know how um, just mean and rude my boss is, how my coworkers are, how they treat me, how they disrespect me. Yeah, but you might not realize that because of your faith and because of you holding on to the Lord and, and being a witness that the Lord is sending somebody to you for you to minister to, for you to pray for, for you to disciple but if our eyes are closed and we're so focused on getting through, we might miss the person that the Lord sends us. Yeah, but you don't get how I'm feeling right now. You don't understand the, the depression. You don't understand all these things that keep happening to me. And I go, yeah, okay, okay. But, but if your eyes are closed, you might miss the reason, the thing that God is teaching you, what he's showing you, what he's preparing you. Yeah, but you don't know. I mean, my, my family, they're going through difficult times. They're... They're facing difficult things. I, I, there's things that are out of my control, my finances. Yes, we need to hold on to God. But we need to, maybe it's an opportunity for us to worship him. You know, I, I, I reflect and I go, man, like where, where's our heart at? Are we so focused on just making it? Just so focused on, okay, if I just get through this next step, if I just get, that we miss the purposes God has for us in our present season. Have you ever prayed this prayer? Uh, God, prepare me. God, grow me. God, let me have your heart. God, I want to live for you. God, your, your will be done in my life because I know I've prayed that prayer. I love it in James chapter 1, verses 2 and 4. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers. And sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Consider pure joy, right? There's, there's this cause and effect here. Hey, consider pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. What's the cause? When you face trials of many kinds, because when you face trials, it's going to produce perseverance, then there's another cause and effect. And then when perseverance finishes its work, you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Consider it joy. Because that process, that thing that you're praying for, God, take my life, God, use it for what you want. God, develop me, grow me. God's like, okay, here is life, and I'm going to use life, and I'm going to use situations, and I'm going to use trials of many kinds to develop perseverance and to grow your faith so you may be mature and complete not lacking anything see we ask for the process but we don't want to go through the process we say oh hold on a second god i i want your purpose but but this is hard i want to live for you but still stay comfortable i'll serve you but i won't let go of the hurt and bitterness that was me for a while I'll follow you, but I won't repent of this sin, God. I want your purpose, but not above my own pursuits. We say, I want God's purpose, but on my terms. And you, some of you might say, well, Pastor, I, I do want to serve God, and I do want his purpose for my life, but how do I recognize his purpose? My question is, where is your intimacy? Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. 
Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Where is your intimacy? What do you mean? The, the, the intimate moments of your life. The moments nobody else sees. The moments in your mind and in your heart. Where is that? Where, where is your intimacy residing in? Is your intimacy with the, the spirit of God or is it with the spirit of fear or, or doubt or worry? Are you having intimacy with Jesus or intimacy with the idols of this world? Are you in the midst of the Holy Spirit and the word of God or are you in the midst of sin? Hear me, I'm not perfect. And I'll be the first to admit that I've made mistakes. There's been times where I find and I go, man, God, I, I haven't been intimate with you, God. I've been pursuing other things. God, I haven't been intimate with you, God. I've been letting fear dictate my life and, and worry and, and doubt and all these situations in my life. It's actually taken my intimacy from you and I've just been residing in this. My mind's just been in this depression, in this situation. I've been there. <laughs> but I love the gospel. Because the gospel says that Jesus came so that we could be saved, so that we could be forgiven. So that as we repent of our sins, that he clothes us in righteousness, that, that he, he forgives us of those things and gives us a new start. But if you want to know God's everyday purpose for your life, you must be intimate with him. God is not a fortune cookie God, right? Tony brought some tea over this week. Vernon got mad because I drink tea and I don't, didn't drink coffee and he was texting me, but <clears throat> shout out to Vernon in Atlanta. <clears throat> but I was drinking tea and then we had these cool fortune cookies, right? <clears throat> and they're really random and they're kind of funny. But God's not that. God's not a fortune cookie God. God is a God that wants to walk with you, that wants to be intimate with you, that wants to speak to you, and that wants to listen to you. See, now in Samuel chapter 17, we continue, and uh, Jesse, David's father, asked David to go, to go deliver food to his older brothers. And I'll be honest, I don't know if, how I would have reacted at that request. It says in verse 15 that he went back and forth between serving the king of Israel and tending to his sheep. And then his dad asked him to go deliver food to his brothers. If it was me, I might have had a different reaction, right? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm not perfect. I mean, I know we, we look at the you know, people in the Bible and we're like, man, they're amazing. And they are. But when I look and put myself in that situation, I go, man, <clears throat> I would have done so much worse. <laughs> Right? I mean, I would have. I, I would have really, I would have probably messed up or made, made some mistake. But if I was David, I might have been like, wait a second, Dad. Dad, I, I'm the personal musician of the king. I don't know if you've heard. I don't know if you've gotten the memo. You know, I got my name badge right here. Musician of the king. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, wait a second, Dad. You know, I, I, I already take care of the sheep. Wait, hold on a second. Dad, Dad I'm anointed to be king. And you want me to go deliver some food? You know, I, I, I see the culture that I'm living in, and I see a lot of people, not just in my generation, but people in general that live with an entitlement. That go, oh, well, you know, you don't know who I am. You don't know what I'm called to do. And they miss the thing God has for them. Uh, we were... Um, we were in Dallas with a master's commission. We were at Daystar Television, and we were uh, the studio audience. They invited our school to be the studio audience. And uh, Pastor John and Lisa Bevere were the guest speakers, if you've heard of them. They're amazing. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and they were speaking, and we got to watch the show. And then after the show, all of our team got to hang out with them, and they got to uh, meet them. And I got, so I got to meet Pastor John. I got to meet uh, Miss Lisa, and uh, it was awesome. But then after that, um, they had an awesome worship team that was also there, and they had all these worship uh, leaders from all over the uh, Dallas Metroplex. And I, I met one man who was the uh, worship leader at a very large church in uh, Carrollton, Texas. 
and I was talking to him, and what I do a lot of times when I talk to people is, is I go, hey, um, give me one a tidbit of, uh, of advice or wisdom, either on life or on ministry, on speaking, on, on anything, anything that you want to give me. Just because I know if I ask that, this might be the last time I see this person in my entire life, but if I ask that, they're going to give me their best. They're going to give me maybe their life message, the, the, one of the greatest things they've learned. And he goes to me, and he goes, yeah, I got one for you. I go, okay. He goes, never let anything be too big for you and never let anything be too small for you. He was saying, never let anything be too big. Never let any of the dreams and callings of God be too big for your life, that you live in insecurity or fear that God can't use you. Never let anything be too big for you to do for God. But never let anything be too small for you, too insignificant, too tiny, that you won't do it and you won't serve the Lord. See, and David had that mentality. Not the mentality of, of entitlement, but the mentality of, hey, I'm going to be obedient to where God's put me. Yes, he was anointed to be king, but he was still serving his father, and he was obedient to his father. So he brought the fruit, food to his brothers, not knowing that being obedient that day would forever change his life. What if he didn't bring the food? Have you ever thought about that? What if he was disobedient and didn't bring the food? Would he have fought Goliath? I don't know. He could have missed it. He could have missed the greatest moment of his life. But he was faithful in the everyday. He was obedient in the thing that God had for him. Through David's obedience, he did not miss that daily purpose. Powerful. So David goes to deliver the food and hears all the trash talk from Goliath because Goliath is mocking God. And David is getting fired up because Goliath is talking smack about his God. And I just thought that was kind of convicting. Uh, uh, there's uh, this, this, this man, these people that are talking about uh, God and it is firing David up just so much because he has this intimacy of God and has this, this heart for God that it is just getting him so angry because God is being mocked. And to be honest with you, it kind of convicts me because... Um, uh, there are so many people that are mocking my God, and do I have that same reaction as David? But that's a whole other sermon for a whole other day. I just, I had to mention that because I was like, man, that's, that's tough. So Saul, here's David, wants to fight Goliath, and he doesn't like the idea. And David goes, wait, I, I know God will rescue me like he did when I fought the lion and the bear. I know I, can, I know I can defeat Goliath, Saul. I know I can do this. See, in that moment, David's purpose was expanded. His purpose was to protect the flock of sheep. And now it was expanded to protect the flock of Israel, God's people. You know, I don't know if David was born a fighter, but I believe he used his sling while watching over the sheep. It says, it says when he tried on you know, Saul's outfit with all the bling bling, right? I mean, it was kind of, it was too heavy. It was like, hey, this doesn't fit. And it says he, he grabbed his shepherd's bag. He went to the river. He went and grabbed stones. He knew where he was going. He grabbed his staff and his sling. And back in those times, sling wasn't some toy. It was a weapon. But I wonder how many times he used that sling. Maybe to fight small predators. Maybe to just practice with it where he'd, he'd hit it, you know, and he'd be like, you know, and then all of a sudden, like, hits a sheep. And it's like, oh, sorry, Frank. You know what I'm saying? Like, like my bad, man. <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, I don't know how good I'd be at using a sling when he, he uses it again and, and he gets, he gets a little bit more accurate. He, he just, just goes over Dave's head, you know, and ah, you know what I'm saying, whatever. So then he, he gets more accurate, and then, and then all of a sudden he starts aiming at this tree and building up strength, and, and then he, he starts to be more proficient at it. I don't think David knew that he was going to use a sling to kill a giant. He might have looked at it as, oh, this is like a weapon, but it's not that significant. What's your sling? What's the thing that God's given you? Well, I just know, I just know how to bake. I just, I just know how to bake cookies. Well, I like cookies. No, I'm just but, but seriously, though, what? Well, I just, I really like to, to just hug people and tell them God loves them. Well, I, I really like to be creative. I, I really like to disciple. I, I just, I really have this heart to teach or, um, or to sing or, um, <clears throat> 
I really just like writing letters to people and writing cards or opening up my home. And so you might look at it as insignificant, but God's given you that as a weapon for the kingdom of heaven. Where you go, oh, it's just, it's just a sling. This isn't, this isn't anything. What can this do, right? What can this, my mom, she sends letters. She probably sends hundreds of letters a year, right? It's like her card ministry. And she'll send these cards. What, what will this do? What, what will this do? And all of a sudden, she starts pouring into people. All of a sudden, my parents open up their home on Thanksgiving and Christmas, and people come, veterans come, and they, they pour into them. But it was just a card. What will this do? But how much encouragement and how many people are ministered by something you think is so insignificant, but God has given you a, a weapon for his kingdom. See, David grew in his experience. He wasn't a mighty warrior from the beginning. He, he defeated the lion and the bear and then Goliath, and then, then he became a mighty warrior and, and fought in, in, in many battles. As some of you know, I, I went to Master's Commission, which is a ministry school, and my first year in Phoenix, Arizona, um, we do this thing called Adopt-A-Block, and Adopt-A-Block is kind of just basically you knock on doors, ask people if they need clothes um, or food or, uh, or furniture or prayer or anything like that. And I remember going the first time, I was 18 years old, and it was, we were taking a couple of houses, and then it was me and this girl, Melissa. And Melissa was like this tall, no exaggeration. Okay, from Louisiana, she, we are first years, and it was our turn to go to the house. <clears throat> and I remember going up to the house, and um, we get there, and I, I was scared, Pastor Justin. I really was, I'll be honest with you, right? Because Melissa just goes right up to the door, and I'm like, what's she doing? You know, I'm from Brockton, Massachusetts, okay? I'm from inner city, so you don't knock on people's doors, okay? Like, I was scared I was going to get shot. I'm not going to lie, you know what I'm saying? I was just like, this is crazy. <laughs> but I'm, I'm the tall guy, man. And got, like, all of a sudden, your man pride starts hitting in, right? I mean, Adam, like, my man pride was, like, really going. And I was like, I got I to gotta do something. So I go, okay, and I, and I kind of catch up to her, right, looking like a fool. And I, I go over there, and we just knock on the door, and everything was okay. <laughs> but, but that's what it was. I was so scared. I was. But, but I knew that's what God had put for me to do. You know how I found my purpose? By doing it. I found it by being in my prayer time and being intimate with God. When I was an 18-year-old kid, and I would, I would pray to God, and I would worship God, and I would feel his heart for me. And then I was praying, I would feel his heart for people. He would, he would show me just a little bit of how he feels for the world. And it, and it messed me up. And it was through that intimacy that I was like, oh my goodness, what, what is this feeling, God? What, what is this? And then it was through this obedience of, okay, God, this is what you have for me now. This is, this is today, I'll do this today. And then through that, I had experience after experience where it it grew me. I remember being in downtown Dallas late at night, streets are deserted, and just seeing all the need of all these people, all these people on the street, drug addicts, drug dealers, and just being able to pray for them and speak to them. Not the safest neighborhood, no, but you God had called me. I knew that was my purpose. I remember being in Baltimore, Maryland. I was with the Master's Commission team, and we were in the inner city, and there's this man, Ed de Blasio. He still does. He's been doing it for 15, 20, 30 years. And he does children's outreaches. And I remember we were with him, and he did, we did five children's outreaches that day, all in inner city. And we were at one that was the project. It was like the high rises. And the kids were over here, and we were doing like these songs and dances. And farther to the back, in front of the building on the stairs, was three old school gangbangers, right? And they were. They were. You could tell their, their, their head guns on them. And they were, they, were, they were just watching us and allowing us to be there. And I remember next to them was this like this 18-year-old kid, and they were kind of like teasing him. And I remember him coming over, and while all the kids are here, we're dancing and doing this stuff, he comes over with a knife, and he walks up like this. And he walks up, and he's trying to actually go and hit on one of our girls and, and try to get her number. That's basically what he was saying he was doing. And, and he goes up, and one of my students steps in front of him. And I, I look at him. I go, hey, watch, watch out. And I go, hey, how you doing, man? What's your name? How, how old are you? Why are you 18, man? Man, what's your dream? What, what do you want to do in life? Wow, you want to be an architect? You want to be in construction? That's amazing, man. And as I'm talking to him, as I'm just loving on him, as I'm just looking at him with the eyes of Jesus, he puts his knife away, puts it in his pocket, and he just begins to go, yeah, man, I remember I heard this song when I was a kid. I remember when this guy's been doing this, man. Yeah, it's good to meet you, man. You see, God's purpose will give you boldness to do things you not normally would do. 
It'll give you anointing to do something that you never could have imagined. I don't think David thought he would have, would have been king of Israel. I don't think he would have thought he was going to defeat a giant and save the people of Israel. But through intimacy with God, in obedience to what God had called him to do in the everyday things, and through the experience of God's purpose, it happened. As I close this morning, I want to challenge you to follow after the purpose and calling God has to your life and not the earthly success so many people strive for. The world's definition of success is different from God's. The world looks at what you do, what you look like, how much money you make, how many friends you have, how talented you are, how great your kids are, uh, what you own, how popular you are. But success in the kingdom of God is called faithfulness. It is obedience. Being obedient to the blueprint God made for your life. Question. What are you called to do? I ask that question because we won't be judged according to what we did in life, but rather what we were called to do in life. Imagine with me standing before the throne of God and a scenario like this occurred. Evangelist Anderson, come forth and give an account of your stewardship on earth. E- evangelist Anderson, I, I'm not an evangelist. I, I, I'm an accountant. I, 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 I had an accounting firm. I had an evangelist Anderson. Where are the 347,566 souls I called you to impact in Asia, son? Where are they? I'm an, I'm an accountant. I, I had an accounting firm. I, I, I help churches. I help ministries with their, their, their finances. Son, where are the 347,566 souls in Asia I called you to impact? Son, where are they? Had you sought me, had you sought my face, I would have revealed this to you. And everything in regards to that man's call burned up before the judgment seat of Christ. Accountant Jones, step forward and give an account of your stewardship. Uh, Accountant Jones? No, no, I'm not. I I pastored for 35 years. I I had a a membership of 750 people. Accountant Jones, I called you to the marketplace. Had you done this, you would have significantly impacted two people. You and those two men would have helped churches with their finances, and those churches would have impacted 751,321 souls. If you would have sought me, I, I would have revealed this to you. And again, in regards to this man's calling, everything he's done in life would be burned up before the judgment seat of Christ. Sister Smith, come forth and give an account of your stewardship. I only raised three children. I I never preached to to nations. I've never even been on a a missionary trip. I, I only tried my hardest to raise my children in your way. Sister Smith, I never called you to preach to nations. I never called you to go to other countries on missionary trips. I called you to raise three children. And let me show you the one 1,579,566 souls those three children impacted. You sought me and you heard my voice. You were obedient to my call. 
Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So remember, in regards to the calling that's on your life, you won't be judged according to what you did. You will be judged according to what you were called to do. Psalms 57, verse 2, says, I, in the NIV version, it says, I cry out to God most high, to God who vindicates me. I, I like the ESV version. It says, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. You saw it on the screen just a second ago, Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Success in the kingdom of God is called faithfulness. It's obedience. Being obedient to the blueprint God made for your life. The great architect made a blueprint just for your life. What he's called you to do and for who he's called you to be. It's such a weighty thing. It's not something to take trivial. Trivial. You are called by God for a purpose. You are called by God for a reason. To do good works that he has prepared you to do from the beginning of time. Before he formed you in your mother's womb, he knew. He said, I'm going to create my daughter like this. I'm going to create my son like this. But so many times, I reflect on my life and I, I you know, the number one thing I, I speak to our, our, our youth students is I said, man, I wasted the first 18 years of my life doing my own thing, not doing the purpose that God had for me, not being intimate with God to hear what his heart was, not being obedient to what he had for me today, not experiencing the purpose and the callings of God in my life. We have one life on earth. One. Man, what are we going to do with it? We don't have that much time. I'm, I'm 28 today. That's not a long time on earth. I only have a few moments. What am I going to do? So if there's your moment, everybody just close your eyes just for a second and bow your head. We ended the message early because we just wanted to spend a few minutes in prayer. But if you say, Pastor Donald, I, I, I want to serve God, but I, I've been living my own way. I've been living in sin. I've been pursuing my own pursuits. And I want to surrender my life to God or maybe even recommit my life to God. If there's anybody in this room from the front to the back, from the left to the right, all the way up in the balcony, if that's you, I just want you to slip up your hand and slip it down. If nobody's looking around, if that's anybody in this room. I see that hand. Anybody else? I'm going to pray for you. With everybody's eyes closed. Anybody else? I see that hand. I see that hand. Praise God. I see that hand. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else? I see those hands. I see the hand in the balcony. I'm going to pray and I want you to repeat after me in church. I want you to join your brothers and sisters who lifted up their hand. To repeat after me, dear God. And I'll say it loud, church. Dear God. Repent of my sin. God, I'm sorry for chasing my own pursuits. I'm sorry for not being intimate with you. God, forgive me of my sin. God, give me the purpose you have for my life. God, I will want to follow you the rest of the time I have on earth. God, show me your calling in your name. Amen.
This morning, we, like I said, we, we went short because I believe sometimes, you know, for sermons, you know, the Lord speaks to us and it's awesome. But the thing that was really on my heart is, is a lot of times we have God speak to us and start stirring something in us. He starts convicting us of something. His, his, his Holy Spirit starts to, to work in something. But because of life, oh, I got to pick up the kids. I got to go grab lunch. I got to go do this and that. We just, just go right back into everything else that we forget to have a moment for God to really directly speak to us. So I don't mind cutting half of this out so he can talk to some of us this morning directly. So what we're going to do is we're going to just ask our prayer team. They're going to be on the wings, on the corners, but I want to leave the altar open. And I want to leave the altar open if you go, hey, I, I, want, I want prayer um, for, from somebody. You can, go, you can go and they can pray for you. But some of you might just need to talk to God. Some of you go, man, man, honestly, Pastor Donald, like I, I've, been, I've been dealing with so many difficulties. I've been dealing with so many situations that I haven't missed the purpose in it all. That I haven't, I haven't given it to God. That I haven't s- sought out his purpose for my life. Man, I've been living my way. Maybe it wasn't even directly sin. Maybe it was just distraction. Maybe it was just worry and fear. For some of you, it's clarity. You're like, man, I, God, I, I really want to know your calling and purpose for my life. I don't, I don't want to uh, get, get it mistaken. God, I want to know what you want for my life. And if that's you this morning, as, as Ray, you can turn the lights down just for a few seconds. I'm going to pray for you. And if that's you, man, just come forward. If you want prayer, you can go over there. But if you just want to hear from God, I implore you. If you need to spend a moment with God, whether it's at the altar or at your seat, just do that for a second. Pastor Beth is going to lead us to some worship, and you can, you can worship. But if that's you, and let God speak to you for a few seconds. So Holy Spirit, we invite you in this place, Holy Spirit. We thank you for your freedom, Holy Spirit. We thank you for your clarity, Holy Spirit. We thank you for your guidance, God. And right now I just pray, God, I pray for the hearts in this room, God. I was there, God. I was there, Jesus. I know it's tough. I know life is tough. I know the the situations that we face. I know the situations that our family faces. I know the battles that we have. I... I know how so many times life can distract us, God. It can pull us this way and that way, and we can just lose focus, God. God, that that we we look up and go, wait, what am I doing? What purpose am I pursuing? What calling am I going after of God? But God, if there's anybody in this room, Lord, I just pray you begin to speak to them, God. I pray for boldness for them, God. That they need to come forward and just receive prayer from you, that they do it, Lord Jesus. And we just invite you, Lord, to speak to us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. You can come forward.